researching rather than with members of the general public, um, citizens, consumers, is looking at staff in um, large organisations. I'm going to pick out some of the kind of specific differences I've learned in that. This isn't a kind of definitive set of conclusions. I've just been doing this for a while, um, bumping into doing just fairly randomly, happened to just do a lot of a long sequence of doing research within organisations around work. Um, but I'm really interested in anyone else's experience and how it kind of varies against this would be great. <laughs> so, the first thing really is just to understand it, it's the same technique, so I'm not going to talk about techniques. You do research interviews, you do diary studies, you go out and you do observation, and so it's the same things that you do, I think just the contacts and the way you do them and the way they fit in is different, so I think that's really important. <clears throat> so the first thing really, um, when you think about it, is access. So, and this is quite different to what we just talked about. We just talked um, in a couple of other sessions about that difficulty of just going out into the wild world in the public and seeing people. So that's difficult in one way because you're out in the wild world, but on the other way, the wild world is just there and you can sort of kind of go out there. In businesses, um, you can't just walk into businesses. You need permission in this places you need to go. A lot of, if you're trying to look at a particular work system, you can't get access to the work. The only place you can access the work system is on site, for example. So there are lots and lots and lots of ways that you can't actually get at the thing that you want to study. So, The kinds of things we tend to see, for example, is even if you can get access to a system, you can't get an account that you can use to try things out. There are test systems, but they don't have representative data that show you actually how it works. So all these kind of difficulties. Um, security sensitivities mean maybe that you have to continually have someone walking around with you, which can, we'll come on to. That can be a good thing or a bad thing um, in terms of that. And you need to take that into account in all of your plans. And it's very easy to fall back into remote working, where you just phone people up and you do kind of screen sharing to try and get around these things. But for all the reasons that everyone said, it's really, really important to get off your backside and actually go to places and find out. You miss so much if you don't go there. Which brings me on to therefore, you kind of tend to end up having a minder. So the cost of getting access is you tend to have somebody um, that is a point of contact, they have to arrange all the access to the buildings, they have to book rooms of meetings, they have to sort you around. And that can really feel like a restriction. It's like having that kind of old fashioned chaperone who makes sure that nothing interesting goes on between the kind of boy and the girl, and it kind of feels like that, they're kind of there, and you're kind of, what I'd like to really do, no, no, we don't need a chaperone today. Um, but they know more about the company than you do, they know more about all the people you're trying to meet, they know so much about how to get things done in that organisation, so you really need to work with your minder. Um, coach them in what you're really trying to do, make sure they really understand what you're trying to do and how you're trying to do it. And it's great, because after all, they can become your biggest advocate, they've often seen all the things that actually happened, and that's really helpful. I think the other thing for me is complexity. Um, with a lot of consumer facing up, facing things, there's a natural kind of level of complexity that's ever allowed because ordinary people have to be able to kind of walk up and understand it. With work systems, they're often manned by specialists who've been trained for years. So that just allows this enormous order of magnitude ballooning in the complexity of how things are and what the procedures are and what the processes are and the level of skills that are needed. And you have to go and find all these people who spent years learning exactly how to do this. And then in a few weeks or a few days, you have to somehow try and understand what's going on. So one of the biggest skills is working out which bits are the interesting bits. You could go there and then just spend months finding things to investigate. So I think the key thing with this is picking out which things. And then it's finding lots of different ways to represent that. So creating rich pictures, service blueprints, creating process maps, creating concept diagrams, it's too much just to kind of hold in your head and hold in notes. Um, but don't be too frightened. You know, being a naive outsider is important. You ask those kind of dumb questions, and that's part of what they brought you there to do. Um, and with complexity comes stakeholders. So suddenly you find there are lots and lots of powerful people who are really interested in what you're doing, or there should be, Actually, having very few stakeholders concerning what you're doing is quite an alarm bell. Actually, if there aren't lots of people who are worried about what you're doing, you're probably not doing anything very interesting. You're probably not actually asking the right questions or talking to the right people. So embrace the stakeholders. We talked about, uh, Frank talked about this, this process of just having to learn before you kind of research. 
And actually the stakeholders are great for this. They want to put their input in. So actually you listen to their input, which is really good. It's really interesting understanding the objectives, understanding conflicts around objectives. But actually you can use them just to learn about stuff, what all the weird acronyms are and what all the organization units are. So you kind of can kill two birds with one stone. Um, they're also really important to understand what's the way they want things fed back to them. They're the people who know what's going to be the good way to, to make an impact with your research and your organization. The other thing I've tripped up with is expectations. Um, when you're talking to people, um, if you're not careful, people will turn up, they think it's a meeting, it's just another bloody meeting that I've got to go to, and they, you know, or it's some kind of test or it's an appraisal. Um, our managers already given IT all the requirements. Why do we have to do this again? Um, the last time we did this, nothing happened. Why are we wasting our time again? Um, or they're just trying to tell you what changes you should make to the system, and you're trying to do your, and they're going, no, just change that, just change that. So make sure you get to draft the invitations that get sent out so you actually set those expectations. Maybe even speak to people before you do that. Um, I did some sessions a while ago where the setup wasn't great, and we were doing some remote screen sharing. And in, in one session, it really, really worked. They got really excited. They've never had a chance to speak to anyone. Uh, no one's ever really asked them any questions about what they thought. And they kept bringing, well, in this remote session, they kept, I could hear they were bringing other people. As soon as I started talking about another subject, they're obviously running down the corridor and bringing in Ted, because Ted knows about that. Tell him, Ted. Um, but in another session, um, someone forgot that we were doing the screen sharing, and within about two minutes, she knew she didn't want to be there. Why they'd asked her to do it, I don't know. And she was actually messaging her colleague about how bored she was and didn't understand why. She'd forgotten that I could see her screen. Um, the other thing is making it personal. People like you at work aren't used to talking about themselves. They're used to talking in abstract ways about systems and processes, and they think that's what you want to hear. So they tell you about policies, they tell you about how things generally work. So you need to keep bringing it back to them and their experience. So start the interview by getting them to talk about themselves. Frame questions so they can't give you generic or official answers. So use you, use your. I want to hear about how that works for you. Um, and of course people will often want to tell you how you should improve the system. You know, that's, that's, that this is their chance to tell you what the answer is. Um, and that's great, accept it, but remember to ask your wife. You know, don't say, no, I don't want to hear that, because that tells them that you're not listening to them. So take it, but then do your classic. So, so in, you know, how does that help? Well, how would that make the thing better for you? What, what problem does that relate to for you? Um, and if they keep telling you what you should do, sometimes you just have to let them vent for a while. Quite often, you're the first person who's ever actually turned up and given a toss what they thought. And maybe that might take half an hour of them just kind of letting it all out <laughs> before they kind of like take a big deep breath and they just sit there and look at you and you kind of go, okay, so what can what, what, <laughs> um, Motivation. Um, the more we spend, um, the more people spend more and more time doing information work. Um, some aspects of kind of classical ergonomics and interaction design become less important. They don't become unimportant, but they become less important. And the things we're doing now, um, Fran already mentioned um, distributed cognition, it's things like activity theory, it's behavioural economics. We're much more thinking, and really, really obviously, kind of motivation, you know, that, that kind of mastery, autonomy, purpose. Those are the things that actually really start to make a difference for most people at work. You know, obviously, in some hospital situations, some safety critical situations, you know, physically the shapes of things make a difference, but in most of the things we tend to come across at work now, that's not the important. The important thing is why people are doing it, whether they're motivated to do it, whether they understand what they're doing, those kind of things. <clears throat> but I do meet managers who still basically believe that people who work for them do things because you tell them they're supposed to do it and you punish them if they don't. And they still really believe that that's true. So a basic knowledge of effective or what we think about as emotional psychology is really useful. Um, and particularly how that relates to productivity of work. And that has to be beyond the level of just happier people do better work. You know, you really need some way of countering that kind of idea when people suggest that. Uh, in large organisations, you'll meet people and groups with conflicting goals. Um, you'll stumble into turf wars, and that's not a mistake. That mis the mistake is to treat those things as some kind of politics that's separate from the thing you're studying. Those conflicts, those issues, are part of what you're there to try and find out. You at work aren't used to 
used to talking about themselves, they're used to talking in abstract ways about systems and processes, and they think that's what you want to hear. So they tell you about policies, they tell you about how things generally work, so you need to keep bringing it back to them and their experience. So start the interview by getting them to talk about themselves. Frame questions so they can't give you generic or official answers, so use you, use your. I want to hear about how that works for you. Uh, and of course people will often want to tell you how you should improve the system. You know, that's, that's the, this is their chance to tell you what the answer is. Uh, and that's great, accept it, but remember to ask your wise. You know, don't say, no, I don't want to hear that, because that tells them that you're not listening to them. So take it, but then do your classic. So, so you know, how does that help? Well, how would that make the thing better for you? What, what problem does that relate to for you? Um, and if they keep telling you what you should do, sometimes you just have to let them vent for a while. Quite often, you're the first person who's ever actually turned up and given a toss what they thought. And maybe that might take half an hour of them just kind of letting it all out <laughs> before they kind of like take a big deep breath and they just sit there and look at you and you come back. Okay, so, what do you mean? Motivation. Um, the more we spend, um, the more people spend more and more time doing information work. Uh, some aspects of kind of classical ergonomics and interaction design become less important. They don't become unimportant, but they become less important. And the things we're doing now, um, I already mentioned um, distributed cognition, it's things like activity theory, it's behavioural economics. We're much more thinking, and really, really obviously, kind of motivation, you know, that, that kind of mastery autonomy purpose. Those are the things that actually really start to make a difference for most people at work. You know, obviously, in some hospital situations, some safety critical situations, you know, physically the shapes of things make a difference, but in most of the things we tend to come across at work now, that's not the important. The important thing is why are people doing it, whether they're motivated to do it, whether they understand what they're doing, those kind of things. <clears throat> but I do meet managers who still basically believe that people who work for them do things because you tell them they're supposed to do it and you punish them if they don't. And they still really believe that that's true. So the basic knowledge of effective or what we think about as emotional psychology is really useful. Um, and particularly how that relates to productivity of work. And that has to be beyond the level of just happier people do better work. You know, you really need some way of countering that kind of idea when people suggest that. Uh, in large organisations, you'll meet people and groups with conflicting goals. Um, you'll stumble into turf wars, and that's not a mistake. That was, the mistake is to treat those things as some kind of politics that's separate from the thing you're studying. Those conflicts, those issues, are part of what you're there to try and find out about. They're part of the subject of study. So ask everyone to describe the organisation's goals and policies from their point of view. Ask about interactions with other groups, um, program difficulties, and then diplomatically you know, play back those kinds of tensions. Um, and that includes conflicts with wider organisational and group goals. You know, you'll often have met someone up here, and they'll show you the kind of all the visionary things and policies about what they're supposed to do. Then you go and meet a load of people and they say, well, this is what we're trying to do. And actually playing those things back to them can be really, really important. Which is why um, I take mind you have to start with um, something more like Franz grounded theory than having a hypothesis. The problem sometimes with having a hypothesis is you can get pushed into the organization's hypothesis. And actually, that is the problem. The problem is they have a bunch of assumptions that are wrong. So I tend to think you always need at least to some part of it start out from actually I don't really quite know what the big issue here and then you find out what the big issue is in the program. Um, the next thing is basically lying. Um, <coughs> with consumer research we understand you know, there are things like cognitive biases we have to manage around those. But it's relatively rare that someone will come along and spend a whole hour of a consumer session that they've come along to just deliberately lying to you. I've had a couple of people who've lied about specific things, but I've kind of understood why. I think one person thought that she wouldn't get the money if actually she didn't quite ask the questions in some way. One person basically eventually, after a certain amount of food, revealed that he committed an insurance fraud against a particular company, which was quite a lot to tell me. At one point, he lied about that a little bit. Um, but generally, no, people don't lie to you. In organisations, people will just straightforwardly lie to you. Um, and they're mainly lying out of fear. They're mainly lying because they think that if they tell you the truth, something bad will happen to them. 
Um, so in your research, you really need to think about what things are, it's got, is it going to be hard for people to tell you? What are the things that they're likely to lie to you about? You know, and it's not following policies. It's misreporting and misreporting information. Um, it's you know, bad relationships with colleagues, all these kinds of things. So manage the expectations. You're an outsider. You're not here to judge them. Um, you're just here to find out things. Make you know. Sometimes you need to ditch your minder. Sometimes you need to make you know turn off the bloody recording. Just go and sit in the coffee room and have a chat about things. Um, yeah. But what do you do if they lie? I I tend to ask lots of the same kind of question in different kinds of ways. So partly because I'm just, maybe I'm just getting older and I forget that I've asked the same question. <laughs> but it can actually really kind of help that you ask this question and then a bit later you kind of ask it in a slightly different way and you ask it and then you just start to pick up those kind of you, know, you don't just say, hang on, you're like, you know, <laughs> and finally, lies of data. You know, lying, the fact that they lie to you is something that then maybe that's a thing. That's a piece of data, that's a piece of information that you can start thinking about. Um, next one is time. We've all talked about time. Um, but I'm going to say something completely different. The, with big corporations, we're used to working with companies who say, oh, you know, the research is going to take this one. They go, no, no, it's got to be three days. In big corporations, they go, no, we're going to really do this quickly. You know, we're doing this so fast. And you go, oh, shit, they're going to want it in three days. And they go, yeah, yeah, because, you know, we're doing this next release, and it's going to be done in March 2014. <laughs> so, yeah, their perception of fast, I think if you come from that kind of way of agile background, a lot of these big corporations, when they're doing internal systems, their perception of fast is, like, completely different. And so everything takes longer. Scheduling interviews with people, getting access to things, getting secure, everything takes three, four, five times longer. So you have this, yeah, this is the amount of effort it's going to take six weeks, and eight months later you're still trying to work out how you get to see that person over there. I mean, it's really fucking frustrating. <laughs> but you just have to do it. Um, but what you can do is you can use that time to your advantage, because that's the time you can then immerse yourself. So yeah, okay, I can't sort of take me a long time to get to see them, but I can still just turn up at the place. I can still just go and visit, talk to other people, look around things, do some do some ad hoc observation. So I the fact I can't go and see them, I don't just sit in my hands. I can do other kinds of stuff as well. So my top tips. So exactly as we've said, you've got to you've got to put in that effort to go where they are, and that's got to be really um, you've got to coach your mind up. You know, don't let them be in control. You've got to make sure that you're in control of what's going on and you're coaching them to do the right thing. You. And you've just got to embrace that complexity. You've just got to suck it up. For some of these systems, there's no kind of, oh, you know, well, we just, well, that's a bit too difficult. Can't we make that easier? Well, actually, no. It's just really, really hard and there's just a lot to learn. Um, you stakeholders for immersion. You stakeholders, they want to come and they want to come and tell you how everything should be. Well, let them tell them, tell them, tell you how everything should be. Don't necessarily listen um, too much to some of that. But then it, it's great just as a way of learning. Um, write the invitations. Make sure you set the expectations of what you're doing. Remember that you're just going to have to continually get people when they talk about their work to talk about it from their point of view rather than the way kind of that abstract classic kind of the process. It feels like they're teaching you the process and you're trying to get continually putting it back to them. Um, understanding what's in it for them, that whole point of that motivation. So why is it interesting them? Why what why would they be interested in doing this or not interested in doing it? Because exactly as you said, if what we're trying to do is make something better. Then, make, then that is a key part of whether it's going to be better or not. Um, politics are in scope. Politics is some annoying thing that happens over there, separate. The politics, they're going to lie to you. That's something you, you want to learn. And take your time. You know, use the fact that everything's going to go slowly as a, to your advantage. Use that extra time. Thinking time, visiting time, doing stuff time. Um, and one last one. So, um, you know, people spend a lot of time at work. I've seen various estimates, you know, 50,000 hours, 100,000 hours, uh, uh, you know, for a working career. And that's a lot of time to spend um, using crap software and following stupid procedures. Um, particularly when that's multiplied by potentially thousands or tens of thousands of people in an organisation. Um, and so good research, good evidence, good insight, you know, is the vital first step um, in changing that. So, yeah, don't try and make them have a scrub.
Thank you.
where we do exactly that. We go in, we just try to figure out what, because they'll be saying kind of like, come and do some stuff. And we go, we have no idea what your problem is, what your organisation's like, who we should be speaking to, how, you know, we, we, we can just guess, we can just pull out some random kind of, let's do some research template and kind of propose it to you. But actually, it's kind of, we don't know. So the best thing for us to do is we come, exactly as you say, we come and we spend a lot of time just wandering around, visiting people, finding out, talking to people, going to different places, chatting a lot, just sitting around, seeing how people work, and then eventually, and you talk to a lot of the stakeholders, and you start to pick up things, that guy said this, these other people said that, those people on the ground over there said something, and you start to get that kind of shape of actually what we really need to find out. So yeah, we tend to do a little thing, but... But also in the main research, I, I tend to don't think having this kind of very formal immersion phase where you're just kind of learning a bit and then having kind of like, and now we're going to have some more formal research activities, I tend to find it kind of flip flops back between them. You have a bit where you kind of just don't really quite know what the right questions to be asking are, so you just want to find out some stuff. And then you go, ah, actually, yeah, that's the thing. Now, now you start asking, well, can we go and arrange to go and talk to them because I've now realised what we need to do. So I, I tend to think it kind of flip flops a bit between the two. But yeah, yeah, definitely try and have this bit at the beginning before you say this we look somehow magically without ever knowing anything about your organisation, somehow we know what we're going to do for you. But I mean yeah, they can be they can be months, they can be months, but actually that's a relatively that can be quite a sparse process because of the fact it can just take so long. Uh, so you might do a couple of days that week, and you might do a couple of days that week, and then you might not do it again. Because actually, it can just have, you know, you try and set up a workshop where you actually say, yeah, it'd be great, we'll have this, we'll have this work, we'll get you, and we'll be all participatory, and we'll get like 10 of you in a room, and it'll be marvellous. And they go, what, you actually mean get 10 senior people in a room at the same time? And you can, you know, when, you know, how, how many years have you got for us to try and, you know. So yeah, those kind of things, it just kind of slow, everything just kind of moves to this slightly sort of, Gradual pace. One last or yeah. A couple more, just about like how you manage, um, like I'm currently on a contract with the bank, it's a mega complex systems, and it's, 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 and I sometimes struggle to know when do I when do I stop, keep going down and down, another level, another level, and you always think what you said is really interesting, and, and sometimes there is, uh, but it's also which kind of, I almost feel like you do have to have a really kind of clear focus on and a bit, you know, quite strong sense of what corner, what bit of the organization you really want to understand and know without getting you know, sort of sucked into the thing. Yeah. yeah, I think there is a real, I think that is, I think for me that's the thing I kind of, um, you know, I don't think there's a really a method, I think it can only just come with time. You have, it's this kind of, Prioritization, and I can't, you know, there's no way you know you don't know if you've just missed something because yeah, you absolutely have to be continually pruning the set of things you've got to look at. But somehow I don't know, you just get this kind of sense. You, you go and talk to some people, and they all say different things. You go and look at this part of the system, and it's really flaky, and there seems to be lots of errors there, and people are lying to you. And you just kind of go, Ooh, this is this is where this is where the action is. And you go over there, and everyone's got roughly the same story. There's a few sort of problems. You know, nothing much, everyone seems pretty happy, and you're kind of like, okay, that's fine. And that, that actually may be the thing they kind of asked you originally, originally to kind of look at, you know, which could be tricky then, because you actually go, well, there isn't really that much of it, you know, it's a bit dull, it's nothing, but, you know, but actually over here, it's bloody dull over here, you know, let's look over here. Right, thank you very much um, to all the speakers, to you guys for showing up, and uh, stay around for a little bit, um, have some more food and a drink, and just stay for some networking. If you have any more questions, I'm sure these guys are happy to have a chat. Thank you.